Uh, my name is Mike. I work with the Florida Public Archaeology Network. I actually manage our Destination Archaeology Resource Center, which is our museum exhibit inside our coordinating center in uh, downtown Pensacola. Uh, because of COVID, we are still not open to the public, so we're still just doing online programming. Of our exhibits have been put online, so to check uh, check those out, and I'll put a link to all of that after after this talk, so you can enjoy all that stuff um, later on, or even during. During the present day is uh, we're giving this. To, I'm giving this talk called of golf islands, and so it's one of my one of my favorite places to go. I'm sure a lot of people that live in the Penn area, this is probably your favorite place too. Uh, we're so lucky to have this resource uh, in in our neck of the woods, and so um, what we're going to do is talk a little bit about the islands and some of the ways we are at. And I'm going to let a couple more folks in because people are still coming in. Um, okay. So let's hopefully everybody can see my screen. I can't for some reason. Uh, please just let me know. It should, it should. Uh, let's go talk about Gulf Island. Oh, National Seashore. Uh, for those of you who may not know, probably this year, 21, it's around or it's been a, it's been a National Seashore for this is its 50th national seashore. You see this image on the right. This is actually the legislation language that was used uh, by Congress to create Gulf Islands National Seashore. So it's been a federally protected area since 1971. Uh, but of course, a lot of uh, different things before it was part of Gulf Islands National Seashore. At one point, it was a state. Uh, and before that, it was used by humans for, uh, as we'll see, for a very, very long time, thousands of years, in fact. Um, Gulf Islands National Seashore gets millions of visitors every year. I think last year they had like a record five or six million visitors. Uh, so they they get a lot of they get quite a few visitors uh, out at the at their place. And so it's one of the most visited um, uh, areas in the National Park Service. So it's like the top ten visited places in the National Park Service was actually Gulf Islands National Seashore. Probably a large part of that is because of our beautiful beaches. I mean, there's so many areas you can go to on Gulf Islands. There are incredible white sandy uh, beaches made from quartz that washed down from the Appalachian Mountains uh, many, many, many millennia ago. And so that's why we have such beautiful beaches. Um, but of course, while it's great that it has all these visitors, uh, of course, uh, that has an impact. You know, people visiting uh, with that many people can have an impact. Uh, and that's why there are federal laws that protect uh, not only Gulf Islands National Seashore, but also state lands as well as federal lands. Uh, so Gulf Islands National Seashore, because it is federally owned, is protected. So it's actually illegal to disturb archaeological sites, remove archaeological material, or even metal detect uh, on Gulf Islands if you do not have a permit. So archaeologists are able to, uh, as, we'll, as you'll see, that obviously archaeological sites have been investigated on Gulf Islands, but that's because they were uh, given a permit to do that work. And in order to get a permit, it's a whole process that you have to go through, uh, and you have to be a professional archaeologist. And I still got a couple of people here. Sorry to stop this. I'm going to let a couple more folks in. And they can they can catch up. So uh, we're again we're lucky to have this amazing resource um, here, uh, just just locally, which is awesome. Okay, so uh, what are we talking about when we talk about my seashore? More than just uh, kind of Pennsylvania area. So in fact, it includes barrier islands and and even areas on the mainland in both the state of Florida as well as the state of Mississippi. So it's got, you know, as this title says, it's this unspoiled natural and cultural beauty. I love this photograph. This photograph was taken, uh, of course, in one of my favorite places, which is the Fort Pickens area, which is really what we're gonna be talking about uh, throughout this presentation. So um, again, keep in mind, Gulf Islands is, is uh, Florida and Mississippi. Uh, so it's not just one area. But so, like I said, it's actually several different areas. This is a great map that shows you what, uh, Gulf Islands actually see the Mississippi area. It includes a lot of these barrier islands like Horn Island and Cat. Uh, pretty cool stuff there. But we're going to focus on this area in the Florida side uh, of Gulf Islands National Seashore. So let's get a little closer up. As you can 
different area from the side. Uh, you'll see fall the Okaloosa area, a little space area to visit. If you ever go to, uh, if you're ever driving through Destin going to Fort Walton, uh, you'll notice that uh, on the first part of Okaloosa Island, there's of course a lot of driving. Uh, if you're driving east into Destin, you'll know that you get a great view of the Gulf of Mexico on one side and a great view of San Rosa Sound on the other. And that's because that area has been preserved uh, both by the military on one side and the Gulf Islands on the other. So that's a great area to visit if you've never been out there. Uh, actually, I grew, up, I grew up part of my life, life, my life at this point, at this point, uh, area and i went out there quite a bit as a kid also we have santa rosa area again that's a large area of, of beach that is very popular people go to opal beach is a, a pretty popular spot um actually last uh year and a half ago they they asked some um and with with the florida public archaeology network and some of our heritage monitoring scouts and we helped them to do some uh uh uh, test test excavating out there. We did some shovel testing out there because they were putting in some fences to help protect the dunes. And of course, because there's digging involved, uh, they want to make sure that the archaeology uh, are compliant with the archaeology. So that's why we were out there. We didn't find anything, just digging in sand. So uh, then, of course, we have uh, another one of my favorite areas over here. It's not really labeled on this map, but it's this green part over in the Gulf Breeze area. Uh, that's the Naval Live Oaks area. It's great for hiking both on the north and the south side. Lots of archaeology uh, there as well, um, and it's uh, a really interesting history. That oh, the reason why it's called Naval Live Oaks is because it was one of it was the first tree farm preserve. It was the first uh, federal preserve uh, of land for the natural resources uh, in the country, and they did that because they wanted to uh, harvest the live oak trees for uh, building ships for shipbuilding, and so that became a really important area uh, for that. Um, and again, you can visit there. Of course, there's Fort Barrancas, Advanced Redoubt. That's on the uh, Naval Air Station. Uh, moving over to Perdido Key area, there's a beautiful beach called Rosamond Johnson Beach. Uh, it's actually called Rosamond Johnson Beach because it's named after uh, an African-American hero, a guy named Rosamondson. He was 15 years old when he uh, joined the Army. And they sent him to Japan. And then later on, a couple years later, he fought in the Korean War uh, and then when he was trying to save some of his fellow soldiers, uh, he was unfortunately killed in combat in 1950. He was only 17 years old. And so this beach uh, was actually named in his honor. Uh, and part of the reason for that, other than that he is an American hero uh, that deserves that honor. But the other reason for that is because historically, uh, what's now a kind of Casino Beach, Pensacola Beach area, uh, until the Civil Rights Act, was white only. So beaches were segregated during Jim Crow. And uh, that doesn't mean that African-Americans did not appreciate the beach or want to go to the beach. Uh, they did. And one of the areas that they were segregated to was the area of uh, Rosamond Johnson Beach. And so that's another reason why it gets that name that it has, uh, has today. And that's an important part of the story to tell for the, for the history of this area. But of course, we're going to be focusing on... Um, the Fort Pickens area. That's really what we're going to be talking about here. And let me move some stuff here so I can presentation. There we go. Okay, there we go. So we're going to be focusing right on this area, this Pickens area. We're going to talk about a few different archaeological sites as well as some historic structures that you can see uh, in Fort Pickens. And so again, it's not that there's not archaeology yet. Every one of those areas um, that, that is there and it's all protected. All of it is protected. So let's move on to Fort Pickens. Of course, uh, it's called Fort Pickens area because if you've ever Fort Pickens, there's a large there on the tip of the island. And uh, Fort Pickens was constructed, was completed in 1834. It was the third coastal system of defense, which after the War of 1812, the United States government uh, decided, hey, we should probably have a better way of protecting our coastlines because we had this war with the British and they attacked our coast way too easily. So they wanted to change that by building these fortifications. Uh, there's several in Florida. Fort Pickens is one of them. Uh, the other really well-known one, beside from Pickens in the state of Florida, is Fort Jefferson, which is down in the Florida Keys. 
interesting to note that both of those forts, Fort Pickens and Fort Jefferson, were built with bricks made in Pensacola. Pensacola had one of the major brick manufacturing um, uh, industries in the state, and they supplied most of those bricks. I think Fort Pickens has something like 21 million bricks, so it's a lot of bricks. Uh, obviously, it's very well built because it's still standing, but again, really important to note that this fortification and many others were built by very skilled craftsmen who also happened to be enslaved African-American men. And it's a testament to, the, to their craftsmanship that these fortifications are still standing to this very day. Um, with that said, of course, the, you know, this fortification was built uh, by enslaved people uh, to defend the rights and freedoms that they themselves did not have. Uh, but what's interesting is that you know, moving on into the American Civil War in 1861, Fort Pickens became this sort of beacon of freedom for uh, freedom seekers, or what was referred to at the time in the in the newspapers as uh, runaway slaves, they they thought they knew that if they could get to Fort Pickens because it was uh, under control by the federal army, and it never it never was taken by the Confederacy. The Fort Pickens was always held by the uh, f federal forces, but they knew if they could get there, they could they could possibly get emancipated. They could get their freedom. And so it became this kind of beacon of freedom, even though it was built by people who were enslaved. And then later on at the end of the war, 1865, uh, the soldiers who guarded Fort Pickens was an all African-American regiment. Uh, and they, not only did they, they help to defend the fort, um, but many of them actually died there from disease because disease was a big problem uh, throughout that period, um, particularly like yellow fever. Um, but of course, that's one of many structures that you'll find uh, and that you'll see on, you know, that's obvious that you'll see on the surface. So you have other fortifications and batteries from the Civil War, uh, several from the Spanish-American War, World War I and World War II. You'll see all that on the landscape. But what you won't see is what we call, you know, or what I'm calling the unseen. And that's the archaeology beneath the sand waves of time. And there's so many different types of archaeological sites that we know about uh, that have been recorded on the island and that have been investigated by professional archaeologists. Uh, just to list a few, we know that, of course, the first people who used what is now the Fort Pickens area on Gulf Islands National Seashore were indigenous people, Native Americans. Uh, there's Archaeological evidence of that they left behind, including things like camps and middens, shell middens. And middens are basically their, tra their trash heaps, their refuse piles, you know, where they would throw away shell and pots and things like that. It would accumulate into these piles. And so we find evidence of that, not only on the Fort Pickens area, but all across the island. Uh, there are shipwrecks. A lot of people don't realize this, but most of Gulf Island's national seashore is actually under water. It's submerged land. Um, so the, the areas that we enjoy on land uh, are also protected out into the waters as well. There's colonial settlements from the Spanish. There's battlefields. There's even early evidence of uh, Florida hotels all on Santa Rosa Island in the Gulf Pick, uh, uh, Fort Pickens area. So all of this is right there. But of course, uh, a lot of it you can't really see, with the exception of some of the shipwrecks. Sometimes the uh, sometimes they will be exposed, uh, but for the most part, uh, you can't see them unless you excavate for them. So, um, with that said, let's move into some of these amazing archaeological sites. Uh, we're going to hit five different sites. Uh, we used to always partner with Gulf Islands and do bicycling tours out at the park. We haven't obviously haven't been able to do those because of COVID, uh, but these are the sites that we, we often tell about when we've done those. And we started those, it's hard for me to believe, but we started doing those bicycle tours 10 years ago is when we first started doing those. Uh, so hopefully we'll get to do those soon. But the first, uh, again, we know the first people that used the island were of course Native Americans. Uh, it's again important to note that they were here before anyone else. These are their traditional ancestral lands. And so we all came after them. Um, but of course, uh, by the 1500s, the Spanish started to come into the area of Florida uh, and even settled into the area of Pensacola. Um, the, one of the, the first, of course, settlement attempts was by Tristan de Luna in 1559, uh, of, but ultimately it failed and it was on the mainland is where they tried to settle at. Uh, it only lasted about two years. Hurricane destroyed their fleet of ships that had most of their supplies. And then after two years, it kind of had to just give up. 
And so the Spanish actually don't come back for like 130 years. It takes that long for them to finally come back and try to establish another uh, settlement. And they, they did. They established a settlement on what's now uh, Pensacola Naval Air Station in 1698. It was called Presidio Santa Maria del Galve. That was the first one. Uh, and so the Presidio was not self-sustaining. They needed to have supplies brought into them all the time. They were uh, trading with the French over in, in Mobile, which they weren't supposed to really be doing that, but they did it anyways because they needed supplies. Uh, but it was a settlement that needed to get supplied. And so um, in uh, 1705, there was a Spanish ship called Nuestra Señora del Rosario y Santiago Pastel. So we'll just call it Rosario for short because the Spanish like to have really long names for ship, but we'll just keep it uh, short for that. Uh, but it, it was actually uh, a Spanish warship. It was a fragata or a frigate. It was a 42-gun warship in the Spanish windward fleet. And so this ship had a really cool history because it was actually it's one of one of the early ships, may have been one of the first ones actually built in the New World. We know it was built in Mexico based on the type of wood that was used to construct it. It was built almost entirely out of mahogany. And I'll show you pictures of how well preserved that mahogany wood is. Um, but it, uh, it served in the Windward Fleet, so it was like a fighting pirates and stuff like that. So it's got this really cool history. But in 1705, it came into Pensacola to, uh, to Santa Maria del Galve to give supplies. And it took on a supply of uh, cypress and pine logs. And it was going to take those back down to Mexico and it was going to be used for shipbuilding. But in 1705, a hurricane struck and sunk the ship. And so uh, this is this is an image on the right of an archaeologist uh, working on this particular wreck. Um, it was first recorded by the state in 1992, and then the University of West Florida. Uh, and, I, and I should mention that all the sites that I'm going to mention were all investigated by um, at some point by the University of West Florida. But it was investigated from 1998 to 2002. Uh, as you can see, the visibility is actually pretty good at the site. Um, this one is is uh, it's it's kind of hard to tell from this image, but it's actually located on a slope. So it's very difficult to work on in terms of the archaeology, but the visibility was was pretty uh, overall pretty decent. So, of course, uh, like I mentioned, it was built out of mahogany. Here's some images of some of the archaeologists working on it. This image on the top left is a, a ballast pile. So ballast is one of the things that archaeologists look for to, to indicate a shipwreck. And ballast was basically used on ships during the age of sail uh, to keep them uh, balanced. Basically, you know, ships during that period were very top heavy. So by keeping ballast or these stones, it weighted the bottom down and kept it kept it from tipping over, essentially. Uh, so that's what you see here. This archaeologist examining some ballast stones. As you see this photo on the right, it shows you uh, that even though they're working on this kind of sloped in area, that archaeology on underwater is done just as it is on land. It's really important that they record everything in a systematic way uh, in terms of measuring and making sure they're, they're whenever they find artifacts or structures of a wreck, for example, that they record where that occurs at in the in the layer of sand or, or you know, some Merged lands, wherever they're working at. On the bottom left, this is one of the tools you always see underwater archaeologists use. This is called an, a water induction dredge. And basically, it's kind of like an underwater vacuum. They use this to suck up sediment, to expose timber frames so they can then record what the shipwreck looks like underneath. And this photo on the bottom right is that is a structure of the ship. And this is the mahogany that it's made of. You can see how red that mahogany still is. A lot of people are surprised to learn that, um, you know, shipwrecks, even 300, 400 years old, even in warm waters of the Gulf of Mexico, uh, can get really well preserved as long as they remain uh, underwater and then submerged under a layer of sand or or whatever sediment is covering it up at the bottom. So really great preservation. They found many different artifacts. This is uh, one set. This is a, a, a Sheaves, these are called sheaves. So these are basically like the wheels on a pulley. And these are really interesting because, again, we know that the ship was there uh, picking up supplies of logs, so cypress and, and pine. And you would have had to have had um, dead eyes and copper pulley, uh, cargo pulleys to lift those heavy timbers up onto the ship. So uh, it's not surprising that we see these extra sheaves there. 
Uh, they also found this anchor, which is really cool. And, and then also I should mention, they only excavated, they only found one half of the ship. Uh, there should be another whole section of the ship that has not yet been excavated as well. So there's this anchor. They found a lot of other small, really things, really cool, like dice. They actually found dice at the site. And then they found this, which got everybody super excited. Uh, so as you can see, this is a, um, a box, a wood box. And of course, when you think of a Spanish wreck, uh, a lot of people think, oh, you know, treasure. Uh, of course, we know that Rosario was not carrying treasure. Most Spanish shipwrecks, most shipwrecks, uh, in, in broadly speaking, did not carry treasure and don't have treasure on them. And so, uh, of course, but this little box made people get kind of excited. Like, is it a treasure chest? Uh, well, they actually were able to recover the box. Um, of course, you, it's really important to make sure in, in the conservation process that we, we don't do any damage to the artifact. So the artifact was properly stowed uh, and stored. And then eventually they took it and they got an x-ray of it. And on the inside were these fasteners. These are, so it was a box full of iron fasteners. So this was probably the carpenter. Of course, ships during the age of sail leaked and had all sorts of problems and had to get repaired. So they always had a carpenter on board. So it's very likely the, the carpenter's box that he would use to kind of repair parts of the ship. So uh, Rosario is such a, such a cool shipwreck. Uh, and again, it's, it's, a, it's a rare find that mahogany, mahogany wood is, is super Super cool. Okay, so uh, so that was the Rosario. Now we're going to move on to uh, Isla de Santa Rosa. So I mentioned that the first Presidio was located um, on the mainland and what's now Pensacola NAS, uh, but eventually it was actually attacked. It was actually attacked several times being on the mainland uh, by uh, indigenous groups as well as by the French. And eventually the French uh, were able to uh, destroy that settlement and they stayed there a few years. Uh, and then the Spanish uh, actually left this area and they went uh, they went really far east, basically over to Port St. Joe to set up another Presidio. Uh, and then they stayed there for a couple of years. And then finally, in 1722, they moved back. But instead of building the Presidio on the mainland, being exposed to you know land attacks, they decided that they would instead construct it on a barrier island that was a little bit better protected from being attacked by um, various actors that didn't want it there. And so when I see, say the word Presidio, what is what was a Presidio? Uh, Presidio is basically a fort, church, village, slash prison. Uh, that's essentially what it was. It was a settlement um, on the borderlands and the Spanish borderlands. Uh, again, they, they, they weren't really self-sustaining. They needed to be resupplied quite a bit. Uh, but this one lasted a long time. From 1722 to 1752, it, it remained on the island. Uh, this image to the left is actually a contemporary um, illustration of what uh, uh, Presidio Isla de Santa Rosa uh, looked like. And now this is probably a, a highly... Um, uh, the, the, uh, the artists probably embellished some of this stuff that we're seeing because they were actually trying to promote settlement to West Florida when this, uh, when this particular artwork was created. But it does give us an idea of what it uh, probably looked like. It was actually destroyed several times and they had to rebuild several times because it turns out that uh, building structures on a barrier island, uh, if not using modern materials and methods and building methods that are up to code, uh, was not a, the best idea because when a hurricane comes through, it knocks those buildings right down. They have to construct it again. So the site of our, one thing that I also like to point out about these presidios, uh, you know, when we say Spanish, uh, I think a lot of times we, we think like, you know, mainland Spain right now, but when these presidios, these Spanish presidios were very diverse villages. We're talking about uh, these, you know, multi-ethnic groups that were from the Spanish colonies, but they came from everywhere. We know that people of African descent were lived here. We know Native Americans not only traded with the Presidio, but they actually lived there. Some of them married some of the soldiers who worked there. Uh, the, the guy who was in charge of this Presidio was actually an an Irishman. So it was incredibly diverse. The, this painting on the right is called a Casta painting. These were very common uh, artworks done in the uh, 16 and 17 and 1800s. And it showed this whole different um, caste system of uh, intermixing of these different ethnicities. Uh, and they all had different names. So these are really interesting to look at. But when we talk about these presidios, we got to remember that these were very, very multi-ethnic diverse places, just like we have multi-ethnic diverse cities to this very day. That's really nothing new. Um, okay, so in uh, the site was initially discovered uh, by a local 
uh, curator named Norman Simons. He, he actually uh, came across some pottery that he, he knew was early Spanish. So he suspected that this was probably the location of this particular Presidio. The first real uh, professional investigations took place by the Florida State University in 1964, and the site was very well preserved. Um, in fact, it, in, uh, it wasn't until 2002, though, that there were three different field schools through the University of West Florida, and that's the images that you're seeing right now. And they they recovered thousands and thousands of artifacts. Um, one thing about working on the island doing excavation, oh, let me go back to that doing excavations, as you can see, um, here's some of the, the trenches that they've opened up. And the, the remains of the buildings were actually still visible, uh, even though they were made of wood uh, and the wood is disintegrated, uh, it's left, it left stains in the soil. So archeologists get really good and uh, you know, through experience, good, good training and being able to identify based just on the stains that they see and the different color variations in the soil, uh, whether that represents uh, the remains of a structure. And that's exactly what they found. These are some of the, some of the many of different artifacts that they found on the site, this image on the right. Uh, lots of pottery, glass, uh, beads, uh, just all sorts of stuff, metal objects. Um, actually, Dr. Uh, Judy Bentz, who, who was the one who was the, uh, led these investigations with the field school students uh, throughout the 2002 to 2004. Uh, she's got a book coming out uh, pretty, I think pretty soon through the University of Florida Press. I believe that's the, the publisher all about these Presidios. So you can learn a lot. Uh, and there's other published materials all about this Presidio, but Dr. Bentz's book will be a, I can't wait to read it. I haven't read it obviously, but uh, I can't wait to actually read that when it comes out. Uh, but we're so, it's such an incredible site, this Presidio, uh, and it's still, it still is preserved. Of course, archaeology is a destructive science. So once sites are excavated, they can't ever be put back exactly as they were found. Um, but there, there is still preserved remains from this Presidio that are still there today. Uh, in fact, a large portion of it, uh, when they dredged, um, when they dredged that area, it was actually, the, the dredge spoil was put on top of part of the site. So that's all probably pretty well preserved as well. All right, so that's Presidio Spanish. Uh, the next we're going to move, we're going to actually jump way forward in time into uh, when the uh, area became uh, on part of the United States. And so Florida uh, switched hands between Spain a couple different times. Uh, by the uh, end of the French and Indian War or, or the Seven Years War, uh, Florida actually became a territory or actually became a colony of the British. And then 20 years later, after the revolution, it switched back to the Spanish. And then eventually, 1821, it became a U.S. territory. 1845 becomes a U.S. state. And then 1861, uh, Florida became the third state to secede from the Union. It became part of the Confederate States of America. Um, so that's where I'm moving on to next is the Battle of Santa Rosa Island with that kind of in the context. So Florida seceded again in, in January 1861. Um, and then right away, they, the Confederate uh, forces took over the federal uh, installations on the mainland. Um, and they were able to do that because the federal forces who were stationed there realized that there's no way that they could hold all these forts. If you see this map on the right, um, it doesn't show all the locations of the fortifications, but we have, other than Fort Pickens, there's three other major fortifications. Uh, three of those would be on the mainland. And he, the, the, the captain in charge knew that he couldn't hold them all. So he, he consolidated all his forces inside Fort Pickens because he figured we have our best chance of holding this fort. And he was right. They actually were able to not only hold the fort uh, in that initial wave of the Confederate forces taking over federal installations, but they held it throughout the entire war. It was the only fort in Florida that remained in federal under federal control throughout the entire conflict. Um, so, uh, there was a little, there's a few skirmishes back and forth throughout that time, uh, but really the big battle, the really the only battle uh, that took place in Northwest Florida, like I said, there were skirmishes, but if we want to, you know, use full-fledged battle, then that would, that would be the Battle of Santa Rosa Island. And basically, basically what happened was uh, the general in charge of the Confederate forces was a guy named General Braxton Bragg. Uh, in fact, Fort Bragg, uh, there's a lot of controversy right now about that name. Uh, he was, that's who it's named after is this, this guy, Braxton Bragg. As we'll see, he wasn't such a great general because uh, he took, tw he had uh, 8,000 so, uh, Confederate forces on, on the mainland and Fort Pickens was held by 600 men. 
just 600. And then they eventually got some reinforcements. But um, after the federal forces had actually attacked a, a Confederate privateer ship and sank it called the Judah, um, early on in earlier in uh, 1861, uh, the Confederates decided uh, we're going to now go and attack uh, Fort Pickens. And they basically what they wanted to do was destroy a uh, federal camp and encampment that was outside Fort Pickens. And this was their re reinforcements. Uh, and they wanted to destroy some other batters. And if they could take the fort, then that'd be great too. That was kind of the plan. And so on October 9th, 1861, 1200 Confederate troops uh, left uh, the uh, uh, mainland over here in Pensacola Naval Yard, as you can see on this map. And they basically went all the way around and they landed on um, what's now Santa Rosa Island. Uh, and basically the, the plan called for these 1200 men, they would basically break up into three groups and they would uh, try to encircle the camp and destroy it and, and burn it down. That was, that was kind of the plan. But there was a couple of different problems. Uh, first, uh, this was supposed to be like a night operation. They wanted to do this under the cover of darkness. So they, they got up like really, really early, like 12 o'clock at night is when they left. By the time they landed, it was something like two or three o'clock in the morning. Uh, and of course, this is before electricity and lights. So it was really, really dark out. So they couldn't see anything. Uh, the other problem was most of these soldiers had never fought before. And so very, very quickly, uh, things kind of got out of hand and they got mixed up in where they were at. They eventually came, uh, they did initially uh, meet a Confederate picket line. A picket line was basically soldiers that were stationed, you know, certain feet apart, uh, kind of keeping watch in case something happened. They engaged them in battle first. And they, uh, all the, by all the reports, the picket line held very well. Eventually, of course, they were just overwhelmed. They had to fall back. By the time the Confederate forces got to Camp Brown, and that was the name of the federal camp, um, the, they didn't know what was going on when the Confederates came there. So basically the, the, the men stationed at that camp ran back to, you know, of course, where did they go? They went to where they thought it would be safe, which was Fort Pickens. So they retreated and the Confederates were able to successfully uh, burn Camp Brown. They burnt the whole thing down. And actually the next slide, you'll see uh, an image of that, an illustration of that. This is Camp Brown being set on fire. Uh, eventually the, the, um, Federal soldiers, uh, they had some more experienced soldiers back at the fort. They they came back out and rallied, and they were actually able to push the Confederates back out. And so while the Confederates did destroy Camp Brown, um, they did not take Fort Pickens. And so that that was kind of how that battle played out. So in uh, a few years ago, I think 2016, the University of Florida, the University of West Florida, Florida Public Archaeology Network, um, as well as the National Park Service, they put on a metal detector training for archaeologists, and they wanted to see if they could find the remains of Camp Brown. And that was kind of their goal. Uh, and they, they, one of the great things about um, battlefield archaeology is that if it's done properly in a uh, systematic way where they're uh, making sure they, they record everything they find, you can really figure out exactly what happened at a battle. And in this case, again, they were just kind of looking for Camp Brown and they found it. And this is one of the many artifacts that they found. This is actually the bottom of a, a Bowie knife scabbard. Uh, the men who were stationed at Camp Brown were a bunch of, you know, Irish uh, fighting men, and uh, they were known to carry Bowie knives. And so this is a, the bottom part of a scabbard to a Bowie knife, which was found. Um, this is uh, actually an epaulette. So this would have been on the, the uh, an officer's shoulder. So that was found. And again, this was a metal detector survey. So obviously like most of the artifacts are gonna be metal because that's that's uh, what the, the tools that they're using to find. This is actually a butt plate of a, of a gun. Uh, and then lots of bullets. They found lots of bullets. This is a deformed bullet. So it actually hit something. And so archaeologists that study battlefield archaeology, based on the type, based on the type of bullet they find, number one, they can figure out, you know, which side it may have, have used it. Uh, and then the other thing they can find out is, you know, if it, if it was, if it hits something, it's going to be deformed. Whereas if it's just a full bullet, it was likely dropped for some reason. So uh, a drop bullet would indicate um, someone was standing in that position at one point, And then a, a deformed bullet would indicate that that bullet had been fired from a, a different direction and, and actually hit something. Uh, and then this little thing right here is really cool too. This has been interpreted as a little game piece. And so probably you think of these soldiers being at camp, you know, board at camp, until of course the battle happens that they got surprised about, but just probably whittling uh, different uh, game pieces out of uh, out of lead, out of bullets, you know. So so that's a kind of indication of that camp life.
Um, I will put a link to, we have an online exhibit all about this battle with more information about it. I'll put that in the comments at the end so you can check that out when this is over. All right, moving on, last two. These are gonna, uh, these last two are also uh, underwater. Like I said, um, most of Fort Pickens area and most of Gulf Islands is actually underwater. So that's why we like to include underwater stuff. And if you dive, uh, you can actually dive on some of these, which is really cool. The next one we'll talk about is uh, the Catherine. So Catherine was um, a tramp sailor, a tramp merchant ship. A tramp sailor was just a, a ship, a merchant ship that didn't have like a set schedule. That's that's what tramp means. So whenever you see like tramp steamer, um, <coughs> pardon me, or tramp merchant, that's that's what that means. Um, she, she, uh, Catherine. Uh, so of course Pensacola by after the war through reconstruction became a, a, there was a lot of commercial industry uh, in Pensacola that really helped the economy boom. And so industries, like I mentioned, the brick industry was still pretty big at the time, but the real big ones was, was logging and fishing. Uh, timber especially was a huge industry. So there was a lot of commerce, um, maritime commerce, ships sailing into the port uh, because of all this, uh, because of all this economic um growth that took place. And so that's that's kind of the context for why Catherine was here. Catherine was originally launched in 1870, was called Eliza. Uh, it was later re renamed Carvenarn, I always say this wrong, uh, Carvenarn von Shire. Shar, I, I think that's how you say it. But yeah, so, so it's changed names, but it was a wooden hauled ship. This is actually an image of it. Uh, it had three masts, as you can see from this image. This is, this is it. It was carrying uh, many different types of cargo, uh, sugar, coffee, rice, and cotton uh, mainly. But in 1890, she was uh, renamed Catherine. Um, in the 1894, it came to Pensacola, like a lot of these tramp sailors did, um, to, to ship these goods to ship goods into Pensacola and take goods back out that were being produced locally. Um, but unfortunately it actually, it wrecked in a gale when it was trying to enter Pensacola Bay. And so uh, it was investigated by university of West Florida in 1998. And so I'll show you an interesting photograph. This is a real famous photograph um, or at least locally it's really famous. A lot of people have seen it. And this is, this is indeed the Catherine. You see the Catherine in the water here. Here's, uh, here's on Pensacola uh, Beach, and this was at the Life Saving Station. Uh, and this image was, was taken during the, the, what they said was the rescue, was this image. Um, so what's really interesting is if you look at the image, uh, you know, the guides seem pretty relaxed. They all seem like, you know, they had time to put their pants on because uh, the gale actually hit the ship at night. So this was all kind of happening in, in darkness. Um, so. It, it's interesting. Well, why isn't it, you know, raining? Why isn't there a storm if this just happened? And it turns out that this, this photograph was actually staged. This is not how these, and, and all the sailors on Catherine survived. Uh, they were, they were rescued, but this is not how they were rescued. Um, in fact, we know early on from newspaper accounts that the people who actually rescued, they were really responsible for rescuing the crew were the, the captain of the life-saving station's daughters. They were actually the ones who, who rescued these. And actually, here's a newspaper account. You'll see this is uh, from 1894, like the, the day or two after the wrecking occurred. It says, a night of darkness, wind, and rain, wreck of the ship Catherine. If you read through this article, basically what happens is um, the captain of the life-saving station sees that this is happening. <clears throat> he has a couple uh, crew members from other ships that were staying the night at the life-saving station. And so he rouses them up, you know, who wants to come with me to save, save this crew? And they say, they volunteer. They say, yes, we'll go. And they get a, a, a gun. And so basically there was the, the way they would rescue people is they had these guns that they would fire out a line and try to like harp, basically like harpoon the ship. And then the men who needed to be rescued could then grab the line and then haul themselves in. So, you know, seems simple, but sounds really, really dangerous to me, you know, getting this harpoon shot at them. So anyways, he takes these three guys out and they, they shoot at the Catherine two different, two, three times and they can't hit it. And then finally the daughters say, well, we'll do it. And uh, on the first shot, they nailed it. And so this is what the newspaper article says. It says, um, uh, I'll just read it because it's kind of interesting. It says, when Captain Broadbent aroused them and made known the perilous position of the shipwreck crew, uh, Mr. Davis and O'Neill and the two members of the crew at once volunteered their services to assist in carrying the gun down to the beach to the point of where the lifeline could be shot over the vessel. But they were not sufficient for the task. That's a nice way of saying they 
they couldn't do it. It was then that the brave young daughters of Captain Broadbent stepped forward and volunteered as assist in the work of saving the lives of the crew. And my understanding is that those daughters were actually given a, a medal by the, uh, by, uh, I think Sweden or one of the Scandinavian countries, because that's where the sh uh, ship came from. So is the daughters. Uh, this is what the Catherine looks like when they actually did excavations. I have, I have never dove on this wreck, um, but I know usually it's covered up. My understanding is it's usually covered, but I know a few years ago, I saw some video footage of it being uncovered. So just like a lot of wrecks, sometimes it's covered up, sometimes it gets uncovered. Um, but it was, uh, this is the remains of some of the wrecks. You'll see the archeologists doing measurements on here. Um, one of the wonderful artifacts they found is at the, the bottom right here. Let's see if I can move this out of the way so I can see it. Oh, sorry the bottom over here. And you can see that it actually has the nameplate on it. And so that, that made it really easy to tell which, which shipwreck it was. Uh, unfortunately, most ships, um, you know, they don't have like the bell with the name on it or the nameplate because that would make underwater archaeology and identifying shipwrecks so much easier. But sometimes it happens. And so uh, that was recovered from the site. Also, a really cool artifact is the ship's binnacle. You know, look how cool this binnacle was. And so a binnacle, for those of you who, uh, who don't know, so probably most people, because most people don't use binnacles anymore. Uh, this was basically what held the ship's compass. And so compasses were really important, so you know where to go. Uh, and that's that's what they found. You can see these on display, although they're not open. I don't believe they're open to the public right now. But maybe as as hopefully uh, COVID you know, runs its course and we can open back up again, it's at the Archaeology Institute. They have a museum on the main campus. You can see the artifacts there. Oh, there's no, there's a little bit closer. You, and you see that uh, it's obviously it's older name, but it, it helped identify no question. This is the ship. All right. So the last last site we'll talk about, I have actually uh, had an opportunity to dive on. Um, actually took it took rescheduling it like four or five times because if this if the waves get more than a couple feet, you don't want to go diving out there because it's it's right off. It's about a mile and a half off Pensacola Pass. So it's a really short boat ride to get out there. You can charter um, dive boats out there, or if you have your own boat, you can dive on. People dive on it all the time, but it is a really cool direct dive. Pretty shallow, it's only about uh, 28 feet, 30 feet deep. So totally within recreational diving limits. Uh, but this is the, of course, USS Massachusetts, which was uh, uh, called BB2. BB1 was in the Indiana, um, which was a, a type of, it was, which is the, one of the first uh, battleships. Uh, this is um, USS Massachusetts is the nation's oldest battleship. She was launched in the year 1893. So right around the Spanish American war. And she was part of the uh, new steel Navy. So this is when the naval ships were moving away completely from those steel wooden composites to just steel uh, because, you know, guns had become so powerful that wooden ships just didn't cut it anymore. Uh, so she did see action in the Spanish American war, uh, but in the 1920s, like a lot of military equipment, she became obsolete. Um, and so she basically was used for target practice. And so uh, it, she was decommissioned in 1819 and then towed to Pensacola. And basically what they were doing is uh, if you ever go to Pensacola or to Fort Pickens area, you'll notice that there are these batteries everywhere. And some of them still have guns on them. And they were using those guns to fire at the ship to see if they could hit it. Uh, just for target practice. They even used a new type of gun that was actually uh, used a railroad. So these were guns that they actually can put on a rail and move it, uh, you know, for moving targets and stuff like that. And so um, they, they were really successful in their target practice and they actually sank her uh, during the target practice. And this is another picture of her. Uh, you can see these big turrets right here, these big gun turrets. Um, you can still see sometimes the water's low enough uh, where the, the, those little circular turrets, you can see poking out of the water. So, so some boaters unfortunately hit it. There is a buoy there that marks it, but some boaters do occasionally hit, hit the, uh, hit the Massachusetts. Um, but she was again, sunk for target practice. Uh, and then here's, here's an image of it, her, her being sunk. On the left and right, bottom or top left, this is her being uh, sunk. The bottom left shows uh, a picture taken from a uh, schooner, a probably a fishing schooner. And you, as you as you can see, it's it's uh, probably a little too close when they're seeing, when they're actually seeing the ship. Um, it actually because they 
because they use it for target practice and it sunk kind of unexpectedly, it was way too close to the pass. So they had to move it a little bit further out and that's where it's at today. Um, but as you can see on the photograph on the right, by the 1950s, you know, by the 1940s, 1950s, it became a really popular fishing spot because um, artificial reefs are really great for uh, promoting marine life to come live around it. And so that's exactly what, what people used it for. Uh, in fact, in the 1950s, uh, there was an attempt to actually salvage. There were some salvage companies that wanted to cut her up and then scrap her. Uh, but the citizens of Pensacola had been using it for so long as, you know, this fishing reef and an area just to kind of scuba, uh, uh, to, to snorkel on that they, they didn't want that to happen. They wanted it to stay. And so it actually went to the court system, the state of Florida basically sued and said, no, it's within state waters or, you know, we want to, we want to have title. We have title to it. It's ours. You can't take it. Uh, went all the way to Supreme court and they actually won it. Uh, and it remained a uh, title was given to the state of Florida. Uh, and then it's uh, in 19, um, 1993, it was designated as part of uh, the Florida's uh, shipwreck preserve trail. And then actually there's a nice, nice uh, poster um because we have a lot of these uh we have a lot of these printed out and you can find them online too but as you can as you can see she's she's listed as number one on the florida shipwreck preserves so uh there's a lot of information you can find about this this wreck and other wrecks that that are promoted for divers to actually dive on and like i said it's it's really short boat rides totally worth going to dive if if you do uh if you do dive or if you don't dive uh, maybe that's the that's what you need and the encouragement to to go out and, and learn how to do it, uh, it's it's not too bad. So I encourage everybody to go out and do that. So that is that is it. That's where we end at for our um, archaeological sites and resources on Fort Pickens area. Uh, again, this is just a sample of the many many different sites all throughout Gulf Islands National Seashore. Um, you know, the only reason we know this information about these sites is because of the protections that they've been given, both through state laws as well as federal federal laws, as well as a local community who really values their historical resources and wants to make sure that they are preserved so future generations can learn uh, about them as well as experience what they have to offer.